Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer. We, meaning me and KB, Kristen Williams, my fabulous co-host, physical therapist, and lit senior teacher. Hey. Hey. Hi, guys. Hey, everybody. Let's do all it. Right. Let's knock it out here. So first of all, this is from Stephanie Kazi. Hello, question for your weekly podcast. I'm wondering what your advice for people with scoliosis is for participating in lit yoga. Mainly, I have a lot of trouble finding the triple S because of my tilted pelvis and lack of thoracic kyphosis from scoliosis, even though my scoliosis is actually fairly mild. All right. Well, Stephanie, I will just blast out here saying, first of all, I would be interested to know, like I have seen personally a lot of people who think they have scoliosis bony wise, like, you know, uh, which is called idiopathic, meaning they were born and then developed it. And then I've also seen acquired scoliosis. So I, we always have to put out the caveat. We actually have to see you to really actually see what's happening. Um, and even then, like maybe it still is idiopathic, but uh, the fact that you said lack of thoracic kyphosis is interesting because scoliosis, I often will we'll see that you have more thoracic kyphosis. So right off the bat there, I am curious, first of all, lit yoga, yes, it can help you. You might not, a lot of people, even they, they don't have scoliosis, can't find triple S. I just had a private this morning and we were doing stuff on the wall and he can't get his head on the wall. And I said, don't worry about getting your head on the wall get two parts. <laughs> if you can get two there and then you work on that because you have so much restriction. For, so there's there's a lot of people who don't even have scoliosis who can't acquire or find that feedback, whether it's on the ground or on the wall. And that's okay. If you can start to work on two sections of it and then the other section doesn't line up right away or maybe never, that's what we're trying to do is find more balance. Yeah. So you, there is even in triple S, there is not a perfect, like every single point lines up and you got it. It's a feedback mechanism for you to use to find more balance, more of the neutral spine, more of the neutral pelvis. And if you do have bony restrictions in the form of idiopathic scoliosis, then you'll work around them. You'll get more balance. The side that's tighter will get a little freer. The side that's like looser, quote unquote, will get stronger. We've worked with so many people with varying levels of scoliosis who do improve um, because bones until you're like our slim shady here, they're not hard. Like we, we tend to think of them as hard and not mobile. They are, they are, there is a malleability to them. They are kind of considered a form of connective tissue. So there is some movement possible. There is some realignment, but more importantly, there's more of a realignment of all the tissues that attach to the bones, all the tissues that attach to the joints. And that's where I think we do stand apart from other forms of yoga and other movement practices is we're really meeting you where you are. And we're saying you can get more balanced. It is not a lost cause. <laughs> So um, that's what I would say. What what would you like to add to that? Yeah, well, I, I love that she even pointed out like hers is mild. I, I mean, some of our yoga teachers have significant scoliosis. Mm -hmm. I mean, like 30 degrees, 35 degrees, and, and they are practicing um, because to your point, Laura, it's the soft tissue structures, I, I think that. Mm -hmm. And meet, I love you, meeting you where you are. You don't need to have the triple S. You don't need to have perfect alignment in any pose. We're looking for optimal alignment for your body. So your triple S, your airplane, your half moon, your, you name it, is gonna look different than mine, gonna look different than Lara's. What we're asking you to do is to explore that proximal strength to maintain a balance, um, which I think will, I know, I don't even think, I know will serve your scoliotic spine and soft tissues, no matter whether it's acquired or structural, very well, um, because the body wants balance. And unfortunately with a scoliosis, we tend to start to lose balance and we start to then, it's kind of a snowballing effect where people start to get weaker on one side and tighter on the other and weaker and tighter on both, you know, on both sides. Um, on the concavity versus the convexity and and it just starts to gain momentum and with a practice like lit that is 
very targeted to try to create symmetry um, where there you know, wasn't, whether it's symmetry left to right, symmetry front to back, symmetry proximal to distal, you start to back that up, you know, and um, your body feels it. I, you know, whenever I meet with people, I say, listen, I don't, I'm not looking for anything in particular. We're just going to look at what you have and address your deficits. Let the body do the rest. You know, your body's healing you. I'm just your coach. So lit is your coach. Lit is your guide. The body does the work. And uh, it's really a beautiful thing when we see this time and time again. People, wow, I've been in pain for X number of years. I started lit and now I'm not. Lit's the vessel. Your body is what's doing all the work. So, I mean, you're doing the work, but your body is responding to that work. So give it a shot. Yeah. And I always think about, you know, this is not exactly the best analogy, but if you have a car that's like 15 years old, but it still works really well, it, you might, it might not be compared to like the most updated, but are you just going to let that car just kind of do whatever and eventually just become like junked out? Or are you going to really maintain it and do the best you can? You know, you're going to take care of it because it's running. It's still really running well. And so maybe it doesn't have all the updates. Maybe it's not like going to go 90 miles an hour. It might go 75 really well, but you don't just give up on it. Like you're going to take care of it because it's still working and it can work really well, but you you have to put in the effort. You have to put in the work to continue to make it work. And that's kind of like your body, your body, like lit again will work for you, but you have to do it. Right. And so um, it, it is, I, you know, we could go off on a lot of tangents here, but I was just summoned back to a woman that I worked with for years until she moved away. And she had a 47 degree curve. Like this is like, I had never seen anything like that. And, um, her parents were really desperate because she was having a lot of emotional, you know, emotional issues with it. It was just, she'd kind of given up on movement, um, and was in a great deal of pain a lot, but, uh, you know, so what we did is meeting her where she was, what I wanted to say is I'd like you to feel better. Like that's a noble goal. I just want you to feel better. And sure enough, if she feels better physically, she felt better emotionally because that was her biggest, biggest barrier. It was just like the feeling really, really rough about life. And uh, because your body just hurts and doesn't you know, do a lot of things, but we did what we could. And I think because we're PTs, we have this mentality and I've worked with very involved stroke patients. So it's like, if I can make them have a little bit more independence, that is huge. So it's, yeah, again, you don't have to have triple S perfect. It's like, where are you? And you know, if you keep doing the work, you will improve. You will be uh, moving more optimally and moving more optimally is going to make you happier. It's going to make you feel, have more energy. It's going to make you breathe better. It's going to make your joints more sustainable. And that has nothing to do with what it looks like or if all the marks line up, right? It's really that, like, like KB said, the vessel is, you know, you're doing the work and um, I promise it doesn't matter if you actually have scoliosis, if you have some other imbalance, it, it really, really, um, it works. We've seen it so many times. Okay, so that was a great question. And feel free again, Stephanie, to send us a question, I mean, a photo too, because we love looking at photos and that would give us more of an idea of any other things we can offer to help you. Okay, next question. Um, this was interesting. So Miriam Tabrez asked, how often should we increase the intensity of our workouts to sweat more efficiently? Hmm. Oh, I know. So I was like, okay. Um, oh my God, I'm taking, my, taking me back to exercise physiology. And I know, I know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know like the exact prescription to that. All I can say is um, that your body does adapt. So, you know, increasing... I know the rule with running and with uh, is tends to be 10% per week, you know, to, to really track improvement in cardio. I mean, cardiovascular is going to affect how much you sweat um, and strength. So that's a safe gauge. 
but I cannot remember those. Well, I did a little science of sweat podcast. So I have some of, cause I had to research it as well. And I think that, you know, what I talk about and you can, you can look at that. That's on a, on a Monday um, podcast, but essentially sweat is going to be different and there's different types of sweat. There's sweat where you're nervous, <laughs> you know, and that's a sweat that you didn't do anything to create it, but your nervous system created the sweat. And that has a, that's a kind of a glandular sweat. And that often has a um, kind of smell to it because there's, there's hormones mixed with it, yes. you know, yeah. and the bacterial, cause it's in particular areas like your armpits. Um, think about it. Like when you're anxious, you don't sweat typically. I mean, some people sweat in their forehead, but you sweat in your armpits. It's like that whole, like, Oh no, armpit, you know, hands, mark. Feet. Yeah. And your hands and feet, yeah. like it's in those areas. What you are talking about, like working out wise is like a global sweat. Like how do you basically thermoregulate? And so people will have different um, sweat, uh, you know, amounts based on their weight, their, um, some of it is genetics. Some of it is what kind of shape they're in. You know, like if you are pretty efficient at thermoregulating, you might not sweat as much. I have become less of a sweater um, than I used to be, but I'm actually, I think, if you look at my stats in terms of like resting heart rate and HRV, I'm actually probably in the same realm I was when I was running marathons. Some of it is, I think I become more efficient. And so my body really knows how, and I also start with core work. I didn't used to start with core work, you know, back in the days of running, I would just get out there and we'd start running and moving. And then I would start sweating. But by starting with this deeper core work, there is, I think some thermoregulation that happens where I get hot quicker, but it's not like this, like, like I'm beat red hot. Like if I run now and I did not, um, do core work, I think I'd still be beat red. I think it's just a different type of demand. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe you can speak to that. Cause I don't know if before you go running, do you do any core work and has that changed in your running that you don't sweat as much? That's a good question. Cause I definitely, it's funny. I, I don't, I no longer get up and run. I, I always run after I work with, a, it's just my schedule right now. I work mm -hmm. with a client. We do some core work stuff, whether I'm doing yoga with them. And then I run after, um, I definitely, I, I don't know that I, I would argue that I don't sweat as much, but I don't, I can't say scientifically that that's right, why. But that's I, it. I right. Cause it could more. also be hormones and all those things. Cause our yeah. hormones are different than they were 20 years ago for sure. Yeah. But I would say if you're looking how to sweat more efficiently, start with core work because we have people who are athletic, super athletic, like do marathons, do all that. And they're like, I have never sweat so much as I did when I started doing your yoga. And I think it's because it just churns it right away. So it's a different type of sweat. So I would say that I think you can get more efficient, but you still should sweat. I mean, sweat is a good thing. Like we yeah. want to be able to sweat. Um, but it does like, I, I can't say enough starting with core work is crucial because you start internal heat. And then I think because you're starting internal, the external, it's almost like this balancing thing is not as dramatic to your, to your skin receptors, to the, the regulation of your body temperature from within, because you've heated up from inside first. There we go. We're not scientists in this PS. This is That's some of this is based on the science that I have read, but some <laughs> of it is also experimenting and, and hearing feedback from so many people. We have a lot of people who sweat a lot in lit yoga and oh, wow. then, but it would be interesting to do our own little study, like over the years of doing it, do they become a little bit more efficient because oh, I have. we become more efficient, right? I I'm we become so much more efficient and light with our movement. So our, our output isn't as much, I would say, I don't think I, I can do two or three classes and I might get tired in other ways, but I don't get tired cardiovascularly or from sweating too much. No. And I used to be pouring with sweat when I first started lit and yeah. now it takes a lot for me to really work up a sweat. Yeah. So I think you can, um, increase the intensity, like, like Kristen said, add 10 minutes, add 10 minutes, add 10 minutes, but also start with core work. Okay. Next question. I love this variety. So someone wanted us, I'm trying to download it and some, for some reason it's not downloading, but they wanted us to talk about our PT. Let me see if I can find it. PT experience. 
um, in terms of like how long we've been PTs, what is our what is our kind of career path been, where have we worked? I think we could just touch on this a little bit because I don't know if we've actually touched on that I don't think in so. podcasts before. So I would love to, you can, you can start yeah. with that. So I knew in PT school that I wanted to do sports physical therapy. Um, I did a specialization in, the PT, in PT school for that. But when I came out, the PT market was flooded. I remember right as I went into PT school, I think it was like, um, some like time or news where somebody put out like, what's the best job to have? And PT was like in the top three and it just went. So hot. Yeah. When did, when did you come out? I came out I, in 2000. 2000. Yeah. Yeah. So the class before me, I think only, well, it was less than 50% of the people graduating got a job. Only 50% coming out of my class got a job. I was one of the lucky ones, but I I went where I could find the job. So my first job was actually working in inpatient rehab with spinal cord, stroke, brain injury, and then orthopedic. Like So it was kind of the gamut. I was on the spinal cord team, but the uh, hospital I worked at was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we didn't get, you know, all the big cases went to Nashville or uh, Atlanta, we got a lot of the hillbilly. I always kind of joke that like 70% of the old women that I treated dipped tobacco. <laughs> like nobody had teeth. Um, <laughs> like, you know, so You're I, like, treated, this is what we learn. I'm not going to do tobacco because I, know, I want I, my teeth. They, yeah. they, they write, they, uh, they would rub WD-40 on their joints. They swore by, I mean, it was such an interesting Chattanooga was a lovely town but it we got all the hill folk between nashville and, and atlanta which was great it was uh it was a great experience but then when my husband got a job up in in louisville we moved up to kentucky and i was fortunate enough to get a job at um a, the so the people who did the athletic training for his school one of their clinics it was a private clinic that was um run by a guy who actually he was legally blind. So he he could he had to hold his notes up this close, but he was a genius with his hands. So he bet, took me bet. under his wing. It was all manual therapy. He sent me to the best. He sent me up to Michigan State. I did all of their osteopathic work. Uh, he trained me. He would bring people in. So I really took a deep dive into manual outpatient orthopedics with a heavy specialty in spine. So I did a lot of spine uh, rehab, post-op spine, post-op neuro spine surgery. Uh, I shadowed a um, pain management doc. I would go twice a week and interview his new patients who were coming in for all of the things we talked about in our last call, you know, complex regional pain syndrome, you know, you name it. Because in Kentucky, we had a lot of uh, auto workers, a lot of factory workers, so a lot of chronic pain. And uh, so I got to decide, you know, who might benefit from physical therapy, who needed injections. I got so much experience with um, pain management in and of itself, which was awesome. And then when I moved out to New Jersey, I continued in that route, went right into manual therapy uh, orthopedics once again. While I was in Kentucky, I got my um, orthopedic certification. Um, my, my, I, I got my DPT and my OCS. Uh, and then when I moved into Kentucky, uh, up into New Jersey, I continued heavy, heavy manual therapy. So I always, this is what's interesting. I, I've been known for my hands my whole life. And then COVID hit. And I was lucky enough to start with, I found Laura and started teaching and I started bringing lit into my, 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 my outpatient orthopedic uh, treatment. And then because of COVID, because I was PRN, I was one of the first on the chopping block, which I knew was going to happen because we downsized. And I came right over to work for you, Laura, in, in, in lit. And now I've been flexing my eyeball muscles. <laughs> to with all the observation that we do over um you know over zoom so mm -hmm. i really feel like you know the universe works in amazing ways one door closes another door opens i've been 
so fortunate to work with my hands. I do want to get back into that some because I miss touching people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I have been flexing my observation and my 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 eyeball skills, my my brains and my eyeballs, and um, that's my history. Mm, How about I you, love Bob? that. Well, I've talked about mine, so I'll be a little briefer because I think some people have listened to it before. But yeah, I graduated, and unlike you, I graduated, and it was it was you know five years earlier, and it was like I just I got you know multiple job offers anywhere I even looked they were like please come and because at that time there weren't as many PTs and many more um, many more jobs and so I also I think that first job out god it's so important I I loved um I worked at a rehab hospital like you I thought I would want to go into orthopedics my dad was an orthopedic surgeon I wanted to become a neurosurgeon so I always was fascinated with the brain interestingly enough I you know, I lasted about a week in, um, <laughs> in college. And I'm like, I remember saying to my parents, I'm like, this, these people are too intense. Like, I, this is not going to be fun. And my dad just chuckled. Thank goodness. He wasn't one of those, like, you need to do what I did. And he's like, you know, have fun. And my mom's like, have fun. You can always go back into medicine. So picked PT for many reasons, but one of them was, it was one of the few, um, medical profession professions that had autonomy. And my dad was like, you don't, you cannot be under anybody's, you know, white coat, <laughs> like, a, so, um, and it was fun. I loved working with people and I feel like we get uh, such an opportunity for the most part, especially when I first came out, eh, not so much anymore. And this is hopefully going to change in the PT world, but we had lots of time with people when I first came out. So that was the, the best experience ever was to work in rehab and to see all the whole, like you, the variety from orthopedic to neuro. And I got really fascinated with neuro. So I, like Kristen got her specialty in orthopedics. I got mine in what's called neurodevelopmental technique and then started um, helping run the brain injury program. And yeah, then I decided to go cross bike cross country during this time period, the 2000 to 2002 time period where PTs were, uh, yeah, there was a gluttony. Yeah. And so my job, because it was a supervisor level, was not going to be, um, they were just going to end it by attrition. So I started doing per diem. I did it in orthopedic clinics and I did home health care. I continued to do my stroke patients. So I did that and then was doing yoga. And then I just kind of decided I was just going to do yoga, but that's when I started infusing, I was still seeing my stroke patients for many years privately and, and some orthopedics, but really the stroke patients I could continue to work with and do everything, you know, it's like the whole body system. So, um, yeah, then it just, then I just created this. Cause I saw again, and this is what we say in our mission statement, there was a gap between what was being practiced in yoga. So much of it was movement and so little knowledge, um, applied to that movement. And then in PT, there's similar that there's a kind of reductionist, unfortunately, because of insurance reimbursement, there is like, you have something wrong with your shoulder. You look at your shoulder and not, don't look at everything. And that's just that kind of systematic way that our modern medical model has, has become. And it's really unfortunate. And like you, I feel so privileged to be able to feel like I can really look at people and not just like the problem and really understand the body and movement. So it has helped me deep dive, I think more than I did in a clinic, I know more than I did in the clinic, About into that. understanding how movement, how, how optimal movement is created and generated. And then what, what goes wrong when it's not happening? So it's like, it's really nice to kind of have that, like we have this rich experience of looking at so many bodies and working with so many bodies and realizing there are some just like, thread lines, if you understand the body and biomechanics well, and then I've, I've gone back and gotten certified in myofascial and did um, some deep diving into, you know, biomechanics, but so those are all part of it. And I think we bring all of our tools in and um, yeah, I miss the hands-on too, but we'll get to do that in Costa Rica. Oh, let me just say, I yeah. have to point out that the entire reason, everybody, that I got into yoga, I was a marathoner. I was a sprinter in college and high school, but I got in PT school and I was like, 
just felt like a sloth. I was like, oh, I'll run a marathon. Why not? So I was a marathoner. Let's, I was a very slow marathoner, but I was a runner. That's all I did. And, but I kept getting patients who were hurting themselves in yoga. And I was like, what is this yoga business and what the heck are people doing? So when I moved to New Jersey, I didn't go back full time. And I suddenly had time on my hands and I started going to yoga, traditional yoga. And I was like, oh, oh now I understand. Now yeah. I know why these people are getting hurt. And a little birdie, Yanula, Ah. <laughs> was like, thank goodness for her. I, I know. I love her. So she was like, Psst, <laughs> you need to go check out Lara Hyman's studio. She's a PT. Da, 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 da. And so that is how I got. So we're talking about, you know, wh what sets us apart. I think yeah. lit yoga apart is. Oh, and it, a lot of PTs over the years do not want people going to yoga. You know, no. so that's the thing is I would develop these relationships with different PTs and they're like, you are the only studio we will have, like, just like you, we were, you're the only studio I would recommend people going to because they yeah. see, and this is what people don't realize. Of course, yoga is very helpful and healing if it's done well. And if it's not, unfortunately, the PTs have seen enough it's evidence. Fun. If they don't even do yoga or walk into a studio, they're like, I don't know what you're doing, but it is not going to be, it is not going to be long-term healthy. So yay, we're here. Yay. And we're not going anywhere. So thanks for that great question. I'm so glad uh, Kristen got a chance. I know I've talked about my experience before, but love hearing yours every single time. And I'm so, yeah, I'm like all welling up here. So I'm so grateful we have this, this um, mission together and we just love doing what we're doing. And I think that's another thing you don't see in the PT world always is people get burned out. Because, I mean, I remember hearing that early on. I was like, why are people getting burned out of PT? This is the most amazing profession because they're so limited. Mm -hmm. They can't explore in the ways we can. And really, um, yeah, so we're not, we're only getting started. So, yeah. All right. So I fun. love you. I love you. <laughs> Thanks for your questions. You guys know where to reach us. IG, Instagram, you can uh, send me a direct message at laura.hyman or kbwilliams99. You can always write us email if you're not into Instagram, <laughs> support at lityoga.com. We love getting your questions. Please send them to us and we will um, present them here. Thank you. And as always, we are pulling for you. Yes, we are. <laughs>